It's just not possible to live up to an introduction like that. <laughs> I wanted this time to share sort of a worldview with you. And to do that, I'm going to have to move along across a whole bunch of different topics. So I really won't do complete justice to any one of them, but let me do what I can with them. It's a big picture I want to share with you, and we can go from there. First, I want to state, for those who would uh, hear this, that uh, it would be my opinion that Native American studies as a, as a discipline anticipates that there's an intelligence in the cultures of the indigenous peoples of the Americas, and that that intelligence can be discovered. This is completely contrary to the expectations of the 19th century in which it was thought that there was no intelligence there. And now we're seeing some. I want to begin this by talking about how to see the world. If you go on your internet and do a little browsing, I, I would recommend that you, you take a minute or two someday and put your point your browser and use the keywords snowball earth. Because when you do that, websites will come up and they'll have on those websites a uh, discussion about 600 million years ago and the belief by scientists that there was a time when the whole of the planet was involved or the whole of the planet was covered with ice, of quite deep ice. And for those uh, in the government who don't believe in global warming, uh, it goes on to state that the big question that they've had was how did, the, how did the earth escape the ice? And the answer, they think, was that volcanoes erupted over millions of years, and the volcanoes spewed forth what we now call greenhouse gases, and the greenhouse gases eventually heated up the earth, and the earth melted the ice, and we began to have the whole process kick into gear. There was a, a, a great flourish of, uh, of evolution that took place in the, in the millions of years following the meltdown. And it took us to the place where we can almost imagine what the world might have looked like so long ago. Then there came another moment when it is believed that a species, our species, radiated out of somewhere. Now, I'm going to leave it open about where it radiated from. <laughs> Some people want to say it radiated from Africa. OK. Wherever it radiated from, though, it reached a point at which there were enough people concentrated in some areas that it was no longer possible for hunter-gatherers to keep radiating. And something must have happened, and our best bet is it was climate change that happened, probably a more arid climate, that forced people to consider trying to control their own food supply. Even way back then, when they first started the idea of, of domestication of food, we have to think that food domestication, contrary to the thinking of people who believe that civilization has been a movement from our lowest potential to our highest potential, uh, it, it seems to me the history of food proves that that's not right. That what happened was that we chose, somebody chose, to domesticate plants. They, but domesticating plants has problems to it. Uh, for one thing, you can only domesticate the plants that allow themselves to be domesticated. So you can't domesticate all the plants. When you do that, though, that means that of, of the 100 or so plants that you were used to eating, only three or four subject themselves very well to domestication. So you've actually reduced your, your choices of what to eat, as it were. Not only do the indigenous cultures have intelligence, believe me, the DNA factor has intelligence, too. And the plants, plants act in the plant's own best interest. They don't act in another species' best interest. So plants 
generally speaking around the world, will produce chemicals in their bodies uh, that are intended to keep them from being eaten. We were domesticating plants that sometimes had defensive mechanisms in them that made them not the perfect food for humans. And in fact, this is the problem about domestication of plants. The domestic plants are not the perfect food for humans. The perfect food for humans were the ones that humans evolved from, the ones that humans went out and gathered, you know, usually the fruits and nuts and whatever it is that they found. But not, they're, they're not perfect, but they, they are survival plants. So when we think of agriculture, you might start thinking about survival plants. But one of the legacies that we get from domesticated plants is the fact that there's some portion of our society, some numbers of us, in almost every instance, that are unable to eat whatever it is the domestic plant is. There's some of us can't eat wheat, some of us can't eat barley, some of us can't, whatever it is, some of us can't eat it. Ever since we radiated out from wherever it was that we started out from, we've had to adapt to new environments. With the very exception of the high Arctic, for the most part, meat played a fairly low role in the ultimate survival of the species. Our species survived because we we inhabited new environments, we learned about the edible plants that lived in that environment, we learned how to live with those plants. And in fact, those plants made it possible for our species to survive in almost every environment that is inhabitable across the whole planet, but it was our accumulated knowledge of plants, mostly, that made that a reality. And it was our accumulated knowledge and shared passed down knowledge that made long-term survival possible. It's what I'd like to call our collective human heritage, was the knowledge of our relationship to plants, mostly plants. Some of that relationship had to do with what we did, we call it domesticated. I, I don't like that word because it doesn't sound reciprocal enough to me. The relationship between, the healthy relationship between a human society and a plant has to be reciprocal. The plant has to benefit from it and the human has to benefit from it. Alas, I'm not clear whether some of these plants have been uh, colonized by humans or whether the humans have been colonized by the plants. The clearest one of all of those is corn. Uh, corn, it turns out, is really quite a mystical plant. In some places, in some cultures, it, it assumes the stature of being a goddess. But corn, corn on the one hand is one of those plants that cannot survive in the wild. It has to have humans. It has a reciprocal relationship with humans, but that reciprocal relationship can be abused. So we can look at the modern condition of the corn plants. Corn is so powerful in our culture that if we were to take all the corn in the whole United States and put it into one cornfield, that single cornfield would be the size of New York State. It would be un unbelievably large, 500 miles across and 400 miles the other way across. And from that cornfield, we have, which we have scattered across the continent, from that cornfield will come all of the modern maladies all of the things that humans have done to a plant have been done to corn. All the poisons, all the, all the biological modifications, all the hybridization, all of that. And of course, what is resulting from it, if we watch and look into the Gulf of Mexico, where most of the watershed goes from most of the cornfields in the country, coming out of the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico is a plume of dead water from all of the chemicals that are put into the corn growing. We're raising corn, but it's not a reciprocal thing if we're thinking on the one side, the corn benefits, and on the other side, the species of humans for generations to come benefits, because what's happening is that we're eating up the biological savings bank of the planet, planting a plant for the wrong purpose. The corn doesn't actually produce food, the corn produces money. We have transformed its, our basic relationship from the corn of one of species to species as a one of corporate to plant. Let me go on uh, about the problem here. 
When I was first in graduate school, I had a very good timing to arrive on the scene at about the same moment that some Hopi elders were going across the country meeting with other indigenous people, traditional societies, and talking about their prophecy. I was very fascinated by that for a reason. When I was growing up as a Seneca, and I grew up in the, in the traditional Seneca community, I was always kind of struck by something about the Senecas and the Iroquois as well. Um, they're kind of like what you might think of as sort of practical. Uh, you talk to them about something, and if they can't actually see it and put their finger on it and touch it, if you ask them to have faith in it and believe in it, they won't. The old ones didn't, you know. They had this sort of like, they had this sort of like, you know, if it's not practical, if we can't actually experience it, see it, understand it, then they kind of put it into another category. You know, they don't mind what, you can believe whatever you want, be a Seneca, you can be the craziest things, but you can't bring it into the public discourse very well because they won't let you. <laughs> In any case, just recently, uh, some people in philosophy have rediscovered the Native American origins of pragmatism. Matter of fact, the name of the book that most talks about it is called Native American Pragmatism. And Native American Pragmatism is a, a way of thinking about the world that demands that the thinker look at the outcomes. You know, you remember when you think about the great quotes from Native American people, you get quotes that say stuff like, let us look forward to what we do today and how it benefits the coming generations or seven generations of the future. Let's put our minds together to see what kind of life we'll give to our children or blah, blah, blah. This is the concept of outcome. And it's different from Kissingerian realism in that it requires that all elements of the outcome be desirable. <laughs> Keeping Nixon in power might not be desirable to many of us. So it's not, this, it's not Machiavellianist. It has a kind of requirement that you look far into the future and ask what are going to be the results of what it is that you're doing today. And that way of thinking used to astonish the British who came to meeting after meeting with the Iroquois and were, were, were pounded with oratory that kept asking them to think, you know, think. What's this going to do in the future? You know, the British think, you know, with the future? You know? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So I, I, I came along about the right time because uh, we were going, and I was doing a lot of public speaking at the time, traveling around the country, and again and again, I'd end up at a place, and the other speaker on the thing was none other than Thomas Benyakia. And I have to say, you know, he was like 70-something, and he, he told a story. In the story, he said that in the past, there were previous worlds, and he says, uh, we emerged from one of those worlds into this one, the fourth world. But in the past worlds, human beings had misbehaved in such a way that they offended the spirits of nature, and the spirits of nature retaliated by causing them disasters. And he said, the things they did are the same things that modern American society is doing, and that we need to go to the United Nations and explain to all the world that what they're doing is the wrong thing, that they're letting greed and animosity and, and unclear thinking, if you would, and other stuff, they're letting them drive them and they're destroying the earth. And what's gonna happen is the earth is gonna strike back. And at one point, the Hopi elders came to the Onondaga uh, country and asked the Six Nations to help them. And the Six Nations had a treaty with them and the treaty was that the Iroquois said, okay, we'll do our best to help you fulfill your mission. Their mission was that they had to go to a house of Micah that was on the edge of the waters in the east, and they had to tell the world, warn the world, that what they were doing was gonna lead to disaster. Now, I was always kind of puzzled about this in a little bit, because my question, you know, even to them then was, okay, then what, you know? We go there, we tell them this, they're not gonna listen. What's the point? <laughs> uh, they said, you know, well, we were told that's what we're supposed to do. We go tell them. And then they said something else I thought was kind of interesting. They said the evidence, the proof that what we're saying is true, they have that already. It's in their libraries. It's in their science. They, they already know that this is true. They just haven't absorbed it yet. 
So our job is to go there and tell them that this is the case. This is what's going to happen. In the end, Thomas did get to address the United Nations. And on the day he addressed the United Nations, they had the worst storm that blew off the Atlantic in New York City in history. As Thomas was in the United Nations building telling people that the world was going to experience horrible backlash by nature, <laughs> outside the street in front of the UN building was three feet deep in water because the water blew off the Atlantic in a horrible rainstorm and the whole place was shut down and everything. And all the delegates from the UN went running home they, and this and that. And believe me, they've never invited any Indians back. To <laughs> to tell their story. Okay. It turns out, though, that the Hopi prophecy was not the only Indian prophecy that talked about, that talked about things. So there were others. The Iroquois have them, and Cree Indians have them, different Indians have that. In the last 30 years, there's been a kind of revolution in thought. It's happening among a very, very small group of people, but it certainly is very powerful. Here's a kind of interesting thing about Native American early, pre-Christian pre, pre Native American thought. It did not believe. Pre-Christian thought doesn't require you to have faith. In fact, it discourages it. You don't need to be a believer, but you can be an appreciator. You can appreciate the gifts of nature, but it doesn't ask you to believe in anything. I think that when all those peoples arrived in all those ecosystems we talk about now, came to a place, their problem was, how do I adapt to this place? What is this place like? You know, they came to deserts, you know, and look at this place, there's nothing here. It's a barren spot. Some of them went to places which are dark half the year. Some of them went to places that are water, covered with water and ice. Others went to places that are so dense with foliage you can't see five feet. And in each of those places, they had to come up with a culture that not only enabled them to survive in it, they had to come up with a culture that made them thrive in it. That is the marvelous capacity of our species to survive. Our adaptation isn't built on our ability to build a new machine. It's not built on our ability to alter a plant. It's built on our ability to live where pla places where people have not lived before, under conditions they have not lived before. Look at where they live. They live on deserts in which there's practically nothing. They live, on, they live in islands sometimes, which have very little sustenance to them. They live where nature put them, and they adapt to that place. To those who think that the concept of global warming is a new concept, let me turn you to the Hopis. Listen to the Hopi story of the four worlds sometime and think about climate changes. The Indians of the Americas built civilization after civilization. For centuries and centuries and centuries, they fought against climate changes in place after place and in culture after culture, dozens of them left behind a record of that. Some of them left behind some of the most sophisticated alternatives, how to live in a place. You know, you can't almost, it's almost hard for us to imagine the, the accomplishments of the classic Maya who were living on a shelf of rock and had no water under, the, under that. And to look at everything they did, everything they did, and in time after time, in place after place, they lost the battle, they lost the war over climate changes. Okay, when it comes our turn, when the climate change comes back, when the day after tomorrow turns into the day after the day after tomorrow, here's my question. Where's our relationship to those plants? Where are those plants? Everything that we learned in the, in the one inter, interglacial period where things got warm and we had a chance to fix things up all over the world, all the survival techniques we learned about our relation to cultivars and everything at this hour stands imperiled. And our relationship to wild plants stands imperiled. The, the big human relationship 
to our cultural heritage is on the verge of extinction, and we need to change that. There's still enough plants left, but we don't have enough humans doing enough relationships with enough plants to ensure that when it happens, not if it happens, but when climate change comes, that we'll have some stuff to go on from there with. We'll, humans will survive the next climate change. Trust me, humans will survive anything. Not necessarily corporations, though. Monsanto <laughs> won't survive it. But right now, Monsanto produces almost all of our food seed products. And that's the problem. We have to move away from that. OK, I'm glad to come here today and cheer you up. <laughs> and uh, I'll see some of you around, but thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>